Amen. Children, you are dismissed, but children's church, uh, kindergarten, or pre-K, I should say, through fifth grade. Through fifth grade. <laughs> We're continuing our study through the book of Isaiah. Today will be a little different. Actually, uh, today will be something I will do that I have never done before. Uh, preaching here for over 15 years, and we're going to look at four chapters. That's right, four chapters together in the book of Isaiah. Someone will be around to not only order your, collect your order for lunch, but dinner as well today. No, I'm just kidding. Maybe. But anyway, we're in a section, if you remember, of Isaiah. We're dealing with oracles. We're dealing with pronouncements. We're dealing with judgments. Uh, chapters 13 through chapter 27, really, we'll see chapter 24 as a transition, where Isaiah is preaching and proclaiming judgments on many nations. We get to chapter 24, which we'll see today. It is a judgment of the entire world. So you'll need your Bibles open. We'll not be reading every portion of the scriptures. Bibles in the back. Open up your app, your iPads, whatever. Have your Bibles open before you. Um, uh, you're going to need it this morning. We're going to stop through our study as we get into the middle of July, around July 11th, and we're going to be taking a verse-by-verse, chapter-by-chapter study and walk through the book of Titus. Titus is one of three what is known as the pastoral epistles, where Pastor Paul tells young Pastor Titus, whom he left in the island of Crete, to, to, to set in order the things of the church, a church that Pastor Paul had the church planner, Paul, too, had established on his missionary journeys. We're calling this series the Gospel-Ordered Church. Not only does the gospel order the, the, the workings of, the, uh, of the, the polity of the church, but also the people of the church as they live a life of gospel centrality. So that'll be fun. Read it, Titus. That's where we'll be as we get ready to study together. So what we'll do this morning, though, as I mentioned, we're going to study the four chapters. We're going to look at each one of the chapters it's 21 through 24. Um, again, I don't have a whole lot of outline. I don't have time for that. We don't have time for that. It's a little bit differently, but hang in there. I want to get through these chapters and get to chapter 25 next week. So that's where we'll be at. So very simple. These four chapters will be under four headings, simple headings. If you've got an ESV, it comes right out of the ESV. Um, the Oracle Concerning Babylon, Duma, and Arabia. The Oracle Concerning Jerusalem. The Oracle Concerning Tyre and Sidon. And then Judgment on the whole world, chapters 21 through chapter 24. So that's where we're at. Hold on, have your Bibles open, and let's get started this morning as we work through this. First, the oracle concerning Babylon, Duma, and Arabia. Now, the reason these three are together is because these three nations stood together in their fight against the world powers of that day, which we know by now is Assyria, gaining in strength. And these three cities Babylon, Duma, and Arabia come together, and therefore God has something to say to them. But remember what I've said before, and I'm going to say it again, is God's word proclaimed through God's prophet, God's mouthpiece, Isaiah, is first and foremost a word to God's people. I'm not even sure if Duma heard this from Isaiah. It is a word written to God's people, mostly and mainly Judah, the southern kingdom. Continue to remind that because it is the message is simple. We've been talking about this over and over again, and, and because we need to hear it over and over again. The message is simple. God's people need to trust in, to rely upon, to rest in God. And that if they trust in things, ultimately things and other things, things will not go well, things will go bad. To, to rest and to trust ultimately in human strength will end in destruction. Psalm chapter 20, verse 7, some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we, God's people, trust in the name, the character, the person of the Lord, our God. So God alone must be our only refuge. The oracle against Babylon, chapter 21, begins with the picture of a storm coming, if you notice. I should turn there, right, instead of keep talking. Of a storm coming, the wind's coming. Coming from the wilderness, verse 1, as whirlwinds in the Negev sweep on, it comes from the wilderness, from a terrible land. And Isaiah sees this whirlwind coming, this, 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 struct, this storm of, of destruction coming. And in verse 2, it says that this vision was a stern vision, a stern vision. Actually, the Hebrew word is severe. It was hard. It was, it was a difficult vision. 
Sometimes God has something to say that's very difficult to hear. But Isaiah was God's man, and God, and he knew that whatever God had to say, whatever God was going to show him, no matter how difficult it was, it was for the purpose, the primary purpose of the glory of God and for the good of his people. And we see this vision, as we see in verses 3 through 4, it deeply moves, not only is it a stern, harsh vision, but it deeply moves Isaiah. Not only because Isaiah is concerned about Judah, as they're hearing this, what's going on, but I believe, I truly believe, and we've seen this before, is because Isaiah shared being human with all the people of the world. Because as he sees these enemies coming from Babylon, verse 2 tells us it's Elam and Media, and he sees them that, that they've been called by God to bring destruction to Babylon, Isaiah himself is moved. He, it's, he's moved so deeply that it speaks of it in physical terms. Look what it says. Abdominal cramps like birth pains. He is doubled over. Verse 3. Bow down, dismayed. My heart's pounding. Verse 4. His uncontrollable shaking. He's a, he's a man of, of tender compassion. And he sees the events that are coming, these, these hard vision, uh, and, and what it's going to bring, and what he sees already, and what he knows is going to come, and it's painful to him. I've mentioned this before. Are we broken over people we see headed down the road of destruction? Are we broken over people who refuse to come to God? If we were family, if we really understood the destructive nature and what's going to happen when people die without Christ in their sin, it might change the way we view evangelism. If we really believe that God will judge eternally, it may awaken us to maybe share our faith a little bit more with people we know that are headed to a Christless eternity. Isaiah is deeply troubled. And then, like many today, while everyone thinks all is good, eating and drinking, verse 5, as they prepare the table, they, they, they spread the rugs, they eat and drink, God says, in the midst of that, verse 6, go get a watchman. Suddenly in the midst of this feast and in the midst of this partying, the call to arms is sounded. The storm is coming. Go get a watchman. But it's too late. It's going to be too late. Judgment's coming. Sin, when we, when we pet sin like a, like a little cute puppy rather than the ferocious lion that it is, it deadens our moral sensitivity of judgment, making the oncoming justice and judgment of God really just unnoticeable until it's too late and it strikes. That's what's happening. And as the watchmen on the walls go to the, as the watchmen go in, that are in the city or on the walls or on their post, look at verse 8, and sees the, the oncoming army, riders and horsemen in pairs, verse 9, they're going to bring destruction. The only thing he could say is fallen, fallen, fallen. Fallen is Babylon. And all the carved images of her gods he has shattered to the ground. And God is making it clear through this prophet that Babylon is falling because of her idolatry. Her wicked idolatry as God reminds the, the people of God in, 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 in Revelation to come out from Babylon. Revelation 18.4, come out from her, my people, so that you may not share in her sins, the sins of idolatry, or receive any of her plagues, the destruction that will come upon Babylon. Babylon is seen in the scriptures as an enemy of God. And we see Babylon fell uh, under... Uh, um, it, it, there's a couple of places in history, um, in 702, 689, the city is destroyed, and then again, 539, the empire. So we're not sure exactly where this stands, but there have been times where, uh, where Babylon has fallen. But the point is the same. Whether it's, whether, whether, it's, whether it's 702, 689 B.C. or 539 B.C., the point is Babylon is that symbol of self-exalting pride, the glory of man. Not the glory of God, the glory of man. It goes back to Babel in Genesis. The gods of Babylon are... are powerless, the idols, the, the false gods, there are really no gods at all, are, are powerless. God Almighty has determined their destiny. God Almighty has stepped in to destroy that city. 
And, and, and therefore, the leaders of Judah that are hearing this message must make a decision when they see this news. Are they, are they going to rest and trust in Babylon to help them fight off the Assyrian nation? And we're, 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 we're kind of confronted with the same thing. Who will we finally put our trust in? Uh, are we going to run to what we've talked about, to, the, to those rel- uh, relationships that are unhealthy and ungodly? Or maybe you're, this, maybe you're here this morning and you, you, you're, you're the watchman on the wall and you see the destruction headed your way because of maybe decisions you have made and patterns you have and, and direction in which you're heading. And God is saying, see the destruction, watchman on the wall, and turn. And by God's grace, he will love you and forgive you and embrace you and fill you with the power of his spirit to repent and change directions. Oh, Babylon. The chapter ends, as we see in chapter 21, it ends with two brief oracles against two other Gentile nations, Duma, which is Edom, by the way, and Arabia, both allies of Babylon. Someone, verse 12, verse 11, excuse me, from the Edomite mountains of Sur, asks another watchman, what, what time? What time of the night is it? Uh, night, the image of, of bondage, of, of oppression, of, of just brokenness. It's a sick person waits through the night, agonizing in pain, wanting to know how much time it is, how much, how much time has passed. So Edom is feeling the oppression of, of the Assyrian nation, calling out to the prophet to ask him a question, how much longer is this night going to last? How much longer will we endure this destruction? That's important, I think, both for Edom and for Jerusalem, right? How long will the Assyria continue to wreak havoc on our land. When will this war be over? And oh, look what it says. Although morning comes, they're going to experience darkness that's going to last for a while. Again, it's foolish for Judah to trust in Edom for help. Verses 13 through 15, we see the oracle concerning Arabia. They're ready. Look what it says in verse 13. They're ready to, to, to take in these refugees who are fleeing the city. We've talked about refugees and the need for food and water. And, and we see that terror is coming one after another. But there's, these refugees are running, oh, caravans of the Dinanites. Verse 13. And then he says, for about a year, verse, verse 15, verse 16, 15 and 16, for about a year, things are going to go bad. Within, price a year, within a year, the Arabians would suffer destruction. Look what it says. For the Lord said to me, verse 16, Within a year, according to the years of the hired worker, all the glory of Kedar will come to an end. There will be no more. And the sons of Kedar will be few, for the Lord, the God of Israel, has spoken. Again, Isaiah keeps going back. The Lord our God has spoken. The Lord our God is in charge. The Lord our God is not the opposing armies per se. It is the Lord that is doing these things. He himself is assuring the prophet, saying, I have spoken. And these oracles are, are speaking to and letting God's people, the southern kingdom of Judah, the audience in Jerusalem, know, don't trust in foreign nations. Even the obscure desert tribes in Arabia, they will be destroyed. God's people must not fall into the trap. We must not fall into the trap of resting and relying upon, trusting in anything other than God as our salvation. God as our refuge and salvation. The oracle concerning Duma and Arabia. Next we see the oracle concerning Jerusalem. God's people, as we just saw a moment ago, are living foolishly refusing to repent and partying just like they did in Babylon. The prophecy, if you're taking notes, is really two sections, main sections of this prophecy in chapter 22. Uh, Number one, verses 1 through 14, you see Jerusalem foolishly rejoicing. They think everything is going to be okay, and it will not. That's verses 1 through 14. In verses 15 through 25, there's a person by the name of Shebna. If you're looking for a name, there you go. You got one. Shebna, his disgrace and his replacement. So 1 through 14, 15 through 25 breaks this section up pretty nicely. It begins with, chapter 22, begins with a reference to the Valley of Vision. Now, if you're not familiar with Jerusalem, it's on a hill. It is surrounded by valleys, um, the Kidron Valley, the Hinnom Valley, um, 
But I think what, what the prophet is pointing out, rather in an ironic, maybe even sarcastic way, is that God's people in Jerusalem are seen here in this oracle as ones who lack vision. The valley of vision. And they are, they are joyful and partying people, and they cannot even see the inevitable destruction that awaits them. The leaders cannot see that the God, the sovereign Lord, creator, is better and is a better defense than any other defense they can come up with. And he threatens them that they will too be destroyed. Now, Jerusalem we know. Uh, we'll, we'll read later on as we get to chapter 36 and we'll see uh, some historical things going on. 701, the Assyrians do come in, march against Jerusalem. They don't take Jerusalem, but they, they do a they do a good job banging up some people there in 2 Corinthians 18. But we know that Jerusalem actually fell to Babylon in 586 B.C. Again, that's not the point. The point is clear. Jerusalem, the people of God, have the prophet of God, not just Isaiah. We talked about this. Other prophets speaking the truth of God to God's people. Therefore, they are even more accountable to their, to, to, to their guilt and their sin. They've been told the truth. They've been proclaimed the truth by their Prophets, you know, the more we learn, the more we understand the gospel. And if you've never come to Christ, you're going to be accountable for being in church each week, week after week, time after time. Come to Christ. Come to Christ. Now, verses 1 through 3, Isaiah describes this deadly siege that will come on Jerusalem. Uh, Davis, in his commentary, community group leaders have his commentary. He writes this, the city is filled with tumult and revelry, a city a rivalry, a city of laughter and lust, of eating, drinking, and making merry, of bloodshed, covetousness, greed, and sexual morality and idolatry. What should have been the faithful city was the party city. But it was so no longer under the wrath of God, it could and should be called the dead city, end quote. That's, that's what we see here in chapter 22. Its leaders were captured, not in a brave defense and a fight against the, the city, but they, they ran away to save themselves, verse 3. Again, Isaiah has talked about Jerusalem and Judah and their leaders who cared for themselves and only for themselves. They didn't love people. They didn't care for people. They didn't provide for people. They didn't protect people. But leaders in the church, leaders in their home, we got to provide, to care, and to protect those in whom God has given us to lead. That's the kind of leadership that God wants. But yet here, verse 3, they're running. Verse 4, Isaiah sees the terrible city, daughters of my people, and he weeps. And now we see Isaiah's compassion again. He wept over other cities, and now he's identifying with his own people, Judah and Jerusalem, his own countrymen, in their suffering, and he weeps for them, verse 4. In verse 5, is clear. The Lord himself will bring that fate. For the Lord God of hosts has a day. The residents will panic. They'll be confused. They'll, they'll cry out to the mountains, verse 5, for help. They'll, they'll, they'll see the city walls be broken down. And the invaders are named, in verse 6, Elam and Kerr. The same people who helped destroy Babylon now are helping invade to helping joining in in the invasion of Judah, and they will siege Jerusalem. Again, could be 701, they could have joined Assyria or Babylon. Both of them have historical support. Which one, it doesn't matter. The point is, there will be those who will raise up as the, as the walls fall down, as the mountains cry out, there will be destruction. In verses 8 through 11, we see what happens. See what God's going to do to make this happen. Look what it says in verse 8. The Lord is going to remove his defense. He's taken away the covering. He has taken away the covering of Judah. Because once again, the people, God's people, are not running to him, are not relying upon him, are not re resting in his strength, but their own strength, their own ability. Verse 8. He has taken away the covering of Judah. In that day, you looked to the weapons of the house of the forest, and you saw the breaches of the city of David were many. You collected the waters. Right? You see what's going on. So you collected the waters of the lower pool, and you counted the house of Jerusalem, broke down some, and fortified the wall. You, verse 11, 
made a reservoir between the two walls for the water, you need water, of the old pool. But, look what it says, but you, people of God, did not look to him who did it or see him who planned it long ago. You haven't trusted the Lord. They were doing everything humanly possible to save themselves, trying really hard, using lots of wisdom and lots of input and and figuring things out rather than first seeking the face of God. Nothing wrong with doing, but not relying on your own strength. There's a big difference between the two. This is self-sufficiency at its best. And no matter what they did, no matter how hard they tried, nothing seemed to work. It never does. Never does. You ever get so exhausted trying to figure things out yourself, not running to the Lord, not seeking his face, his word, his people, and then you get that, you know, months later, you're just like, ah, I'm done. (laughs) Oh, I should have done this from the very beginning. Let me make a phone call. Let me get on my knees. Let me open up the word. And look what it says in verse 12. In that day, the Lord God of hosts called for weeping. God called them to brokenness. God called them to be broken over their sins and called them to turn from the sins in verse 12. Well, what did they do? Verse 13, let us eat and drink. Tomorrow we die. Que sera, sera. Deluded in thinking that they can work really, really hard, preparation for war, and then rejoice over their wonderful accomplishment, have this jubilant feast of cattle. See what it says, sheep and wine. When, 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 we, when we become increasingly blind to our sin, deaf, and we seeking our own pleasures, the result is verse 14. Their sin cannot, it will not be atoned for. Look what it says. The Lord of hosts has revealed himself in my ears. Surely this iniquity, this sin, Will not be atoned for you until you die, says the Lord God of hosts. A people who don't recognize their sin will never exercise faith in God's provision. For those who do not recognize their own sin will never exercise faith in God's provision. Why bother? And since the Judeans, uh, those in Judah, refuse to repent and turn to God, their enemies will come in and they will be destroyed. Family, it's a call. This, this, uh, this is first and foremost a call to the southern kingdom of Judah, but it's a call for people everywhere. Every nation, every tongue, every tribe to recognize their sin. Trying not to be their own Savior and Lords. Trying not to rescue themselves from the judgment of God, but running to God. Trusting in him. Isaiah is not saying in verse 14, we talk a lot about the atonement here. We're, we're Christ-centered, gospel-centered church. Isaiah is not saying that the people will atone for their sins through their death. That's not what he's saying in verse 14. Rather, death will bring the opportunity where there will be no forgiveness of sin. There will be no opportunity to turn and ask for forgiveness. Death will come and the people will die without having their iniquity atoned for. That's what he's saying in verse 14. But interesting, paradoxically, death is a means by which atonement takes place. Actually, in Jerusalem, in that day, animals were sacrificed. Blood was spilled. Death did occur regularly in the temple of Jerusalem, the city of David, verse 9, as a means of atonement, Yom Kippur. God will judge sin, the ugliest and the most shameful and brokenness of sins. But there is no sin that cannot be atoned for when we we acknowledge sin. The infinite value of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. God calls on sinners to repent. And then God provides the means by which sinners can be pardoned. Ultimately, it is the finished work of Christ. It is the work of Christ on the cross who died in our place as our substitute. Atoning for our sins that we can be pardoned and atoned for. Jerusalem, foolishly rejoicing, will die without atonement. And verse 15 through 25, we see the disgrace and replacement of Shebna. And you see, you notice in verse 15, we kind of move from a national warning to an individual warning. Imagine being this guy, having your name written in Scripture for thousands of years. His name is Shebna, right? He, he was a steward, verse 15 and 16. Uh, in other words, he was a powerful position in the king's court. He arrogantly and pridefully uh, misused the entitlement of his office to gain uh, his own privilege, his own place of privileges, 
uh, including a lavish tomb where he thought he would be buried with honors, as you see in verse 16. Behold, though, God declares that you will be, look at verse 18, whirled around, right? Whirled around and around and thrown like a ball into the wide land, and there you will die. And there shall be your glorious chariots, your shame, or, or you shame of your master's house. So we see this man not in dignity, not in, not in uh, 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 honor, but disgrace and humiliation put down by God and dies. But, verse 20, God raises up someone. Eliakim, Eliakim. Elikiah, however you want to say it. He's the son of Hilkiah. That has a couple more names. God will clothe him with Shebna's robe and sash, the ceremonial uh, uh, appropriate attire for that uh, steward. And he will install him to serve God's people in Jerusalem and in Judea, verse 21. And then look at verse 22, this remarkable prophecy. After this, Eliakim is, is, is robed and sash with the appropriate um, clothing taken from Shebna. He says, and I, verse 22, and I will place on his shoulder, the Lord talking, the key of the house of David. We talk a lot about that. He shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. In other words, I will give him the key to the kingdom, controlling who comes to the palace and who cannot get to the palace. Those who come to see the king, those who will not come to see the king. And this man, Eliakim, will be firm. Look what he says, a firm peg for his father's house. Everything will hang on him. All the descendants of his father's house. Verse 23, 24. Honor of his father's house. He's dependable. He, he'll, be a, he'll be a solid foundation for the government and for the nation of Judah. Like a tent driven into the ground. Like a root, a, a strongly rooted hanger on the wall. God promises that Eliakim will be that solid support for those who depend on him. What a, what a contrast to the self-centered, selfish, prideful Shebna. But even him, even Eliakim should not be trusted in. No human being should be trusted. Look at the end of verse 25. He too will die. He will be cut down and fall. And you see this contrast of this firm foundation to this falling down of this, of this peg. And I don't think it's anything that he's done wrong. I, I, I may be reading into it, but I, I think the fact is that he is not eternal. He, he's a man. He will die. He will, he will not be there to hold the nation and we see in Judah these, these godly men, we see these ungodly men. But ultimately, the good and the bad of these human leaders will what? Disappear and die off. But ultimately, the good and bad will not only die off, but it really points, doesn't it? It's a picture of the perfect one, who is Jesus, the perfect, spotless, righteous king. Actually, verse 22 is the same verse, is the same, is quoted, I should say, in Revelations 3 of the glorified Christ. He, Christ, is the one, Revelations 3 says, who holds the key, who, who, what he opens, no one will close, and what he closes, no one will open. Unlike any other human leader, Christ is the risen one, the perfect, spotless Righteous one. He's the one who rose from the dead. He alone will never die again. He is the infinitely strong peg that can never be cut down or fall away. Everything hanging on Christ will be held securely for eternity. And we've pointed this perfect work of Christ. The oracle concerning Jerusalem. Briefly, chapter 23, the oracle concerning Tyre and Sidon. This really concludes, by the way, chapter 23 really con concludes the, this oracles of the nations. We come to Tyre and Sidon. We'll, we'll look at the, the fall of all of mankind in chapter 24. Tyre was a city that was on the coast. It was on the Mediterranean Sea. Um, Tyre means rock. There was a rock that, that jets out as part of the, the uh, island. Uh, it's a very important city. 
on the Mediterranean. It's a city in Phoenicia. Um, it was a city that's about 100 miles northwest of Jerusalem. Both Tyre and Sidon are, are two main important commercial centers for business and for shipping, right? They were on the coast of the Mediterranean. And this oracle, again, breaks it to two parts. 1 through 14 speaks about the destruction, 1 through 14. And then 15 through 18 speak about the commitment that they will make to the Lord. And if you look with me, again, just quickly here, you see two imperatives, commands. Chapter 23, verse 1, wail, O ships of Tarshish. And chapter 23, verse 2, be still. Actually, the word is to really, a uh, better translation is to mourn. So th- these cities were extremely wealthy. A lot of shipping came through those ports. Very important shipping trade. Carried, on, carried out many things like Egyptian grain to the markets to these foreign nations. And Isaiah says, the best thing y'all can do right now is to wail and to mourn because your city will be destroyed. Verse 3, the, the merchants of Sidon are busy, are prosperous, but the sea speaks, uh, the, uh, has spoken and mourns its loss so bad that even Egypt, verse 5, joins in. They're distraught because as Tyre goes down, as Sidon is destroyed, they too will lose their prosperous trade. Now, verses 7 through 9, we see God again, sovereign over the earth. Look at verse 9. The Lord of hosts has purposed it to defile the pompous pride of all glory, man's glory, to dishonor all the honored of the earth. So as God, we've seen this over and over again. He doesn't take self-glory, uh, pompous pride lightly. Oswald, in his commentary, says this. The instrument of God's choice is the same one he used against Jerusalem, Babylon, Egypt, and Assyria. Moreover, the offense is the one of the same. The belief, now listen, the belief that humanity in itself can care for its own needs, end quote. In other words, they, they were rich in their commerce, but God is showing them that God alone is to be glorified, is to be made much of, is to be treasured above all earthly treasures. He's the one to be set apart as holy. So all exaltation of mankind, which takes place away from the glory of God to the beauty and magnificence of God will be brought down. That's the first section. Look at verse 15. I have loved this about Isaiah. Isaiah has destruction and judgment and and disaster coming, but then there's always that but God, right? But God who is rich in mercy, Ephesians tells us, after telling us about our sin, but God. It's a word of restoration, of commitment, and submission to the Lord. And look what it says. The 70 years speaks of the Assyrian destruction. But there comes a time after the 70 years that Assyria will actually will be declining and, and will actually be destroyed. And, and Tyre will, will return to the wealth and prosperity. Unfortunately, Isaiah likens it to the prostitute. <laughs> it's not me. I'm just... I'm just is here giving you the word as a prostitute on the strip making money. How do you know the prostitute makes strip on the money? I'm just saying. I read it somewhere. <laughs> her song, look what it says. Her song will, will have its effect. There will be a period of distress, but she will retain something of her former fame as, as a trading city of the world. And because it is the Lord who will visit them, Tyree will present her gifts to the Lord. It's amazing. Verse 17 At the end of 70 years, the Lord will visit Tyre, and she will return to her wage and will prostitute herself with all the kingdoms of the world and the face of the earth. You think, well, that doesn't sound good. Keep reading. Her merchandise and her wages will be what? Holy to the Lord. It will not be stored or hoarded, but her merchandise will supply abundant food and fine clothing for those who dwell before the Lord. So it's a comparison But what they're saying is, you know, Tyree, uh, even though it had this great financial uh, place on the earth, they will be destroyed. But one day, they will be a blessing to God's people. The lessons for Judah and for all of us is clear. Again, trust the Lord. We can choose to become proud. We can choose to rest on our finances, on our finances, on, on what we have and the stuff we have. The accomplishments, depending on our own great, you know, strength. Or we can humbly want to give glory to God. Giving thanks to God all that we have. 
We need to be reminded of that, do we not? We, we want to give, we want to be good stewards of what God's given us, not only giving him glory, but yet using it also for the supporting of his work. Tyree teaches us that trusting in economic and prosperity power as well is just as bad as military power as we've seen over and over again. But I'll tell you something. When God shows up like he did his entire, when God shows up, things change. When people trust God, hearts begin to change. And Luke chapter 6 is the Lord himself proclaiming, caring for, loving, and comforting the people of Tyre and preaching the gospel. And a great number of Tyre and Sidon come to faith. In fact, Matthew 15, uh, a Syro-Phoenician woman from Tyre comes and she begs Jesus to heal my demon-possessed daughter. And Jesus says, yes, I'll do that. In Acts chapter 1, the church of Tyre meets Paul at the seaport and spends time with him, praying with him, and I'm sure gifting him as they send them off. David says, how sweet is the grace of God to move through the wreckage of Tyre's lust and greed and create some true gems. People who will spend eternity praising God for grace they found in Christ, end quote. Isn't that beautiful? And finally, we get to the judgment of the whole earth. Verse tw chapter 24, if you're there with me. 24 through 27 really is the capstone of the judgment of the nations. Chapter 24 teaches us that in his prophecy, in Isaiah's prophecy, that God holds every nation accountable to God. And all nations will receive the punishment due their sins. One which will cover the entire covenant-breaking earth. But then chapter 24 opens up this window and we'll see next week even more. The love of God, the mercy of God, the restoration of God, the redemption of God, as we see in chapter 25, 26, and 27. And the overriding theme is the triumph of God. The triumph of God, not just over his enemies, but the triumph of God for his people. Isaiah wants to make it plain that God is the sovereign actor of the universe. In just a few weeks, we'll see this contrast in chapters 24 as we get into 25 and 26 and 27. The city of man versus the city of God. And we see that the city of man will be destroyed. It will be cast down. But we see the city of God where there is, where there is um, a, a security. There is, there is life. There is there's plenty. There is abundance. And we'll see the contrast of these cities. And we'll also see the contrast of these songs. We see the songs in the city of men that are uh, drunken songs that will come to an end. But we see, we'll see soon the song of Judah singing to the Lord about his strength to save the helpless people who finally give up trying out, trying to save themselves and compassionate enough to redeem the sinful people. We'll see that as we move forward. But now we're in 24 just quickly again. We'll walk through this. It's not Tyre. It's not Babylon. It's the whole earth. The whole earth. It's not so much apocalyptic literature, as some call it, but it's more eschatological. In other words, it's about the end time, what will take place when God will judge the whole world. He will bring to an end the pride and the broken and rebelliousness of, rebellious, rebelliousness of this people and set up the glorious kingdom he has established and will establish in the future. God alone will be praised. His people will remain. The wicked will be destroyed, but there'll be peace and singing on the earth. Now look at me, uh, look with me in verses 1 through 6. We see this worldwide destruction. The earth is under a curse. They've broken God's law from the highest to the lowest. No one will escape, right? Only a, a remnant will return. God's destruction is for everyone. Look what it says. The people, the priest, the slave, the masters, the maid, the mistress, buyer and seller, and so on. So religious, domestic, commercial, rank, wealth, whatever it is, possession, power, doesn't mean a thing. When God's judgment comes, it comes down on everyone. Verse 1, God declares that he will empty and pour out the earth. Verse 3, the whole earth will be utterly empty. In other words, verse 1 and verse 3 say that the earth itself will be void of sin and brokenness, it'll be empty, it'll be a wasteland. For the Lord has spoken. Notice what he says. Isaiah, over and over in these past four chapters, the Lord has spoken, the Lord has spoken, the Lord has spoken. Because Isaiah was a prophet, was the man of God that understood that God 
can and has communicated, listen now, truth, communicated his will clearly to his people. He was assured of that. I have to ask, are you that sure? When you open up God's word and the reading of the scripture, are you standing on it as if God is making his promise to you? Isaiah was that kind of guy. Knowing that God does communicate his truth. And he stood on that promise. Verse 4, the land is vegetation. The people will dry up, will waste away. There's a lack of water. There's probably a drought. Why? Verse 5, they defile the land. Sin defiles the land. They transgress. Look what it says, verse 5. Disobeyed the law. They violated its statutes. Verse 5 is a key to this, to this whole section. They rejected divine absolutes. They made their own truth. They decided with their own morality, and they're being judged. And look what it says. They disregarded the relationship that God established. Uh, chapter uh, 24, verse 5c. They've broken the everlasting covenant. God's a covenant-making God, making covenants with his people. I believe he's talking about the Adam covenant, the Adamic covenant. Some people think maybe it's the Mosaic covenant. But either way, God has covenanted with his people, and God has made a covenant with his people. When God created the world, he created mankind. He did not create it for man's glory. He created it for his own glory. Man was placed upon the earth to worship him, to trust him, to praise him, to serve him, to reflect his glory, to take dominion over the world. Steward it well. But sin comes, Genesis 3, and the curse comes. And now the whole creation groans and labors and pains. And the moral standard of God given to Adam, I believe then, but also in the Mosaic law, was the law that was given to all mankind. You can't say, well, I'm, I'm Jewish, therefore, you know, I, I shouldn't kill anybody, but I'm, I'm Italian, I'm a Gentile, murder is perfectly fine, right? It doesn't make sense. That's why the Apostle Paul, when he lays out in chapters 1, 2, and 3 in Romans, talking about, you know, really just laying out the reality that all have sinned against God are, in, are accountable to him, he says in chapter 3, verse 19, so that every mouth may be stopped. The law was given so that every mouth may be stopped. And the whole world may be accountable to him. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So no reason, no, you know, there's no accident, verse 6, of what's going to happen. But, but a holy moral consequence will come upon the earth. Therefore, a curse devours the earth, and its inhabitants suffer for their guilt. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are scorched, and few men are left. There's that but God. But a few men are left. Judgment will come. Covenant relationship has been broken. Sin will be judged, yet there are a few left. Look at verse 6b. He goes on. Oh, excuse me, 6b. A few men are left. The picture is the elect. The picture is those of God. Those who have been chosen by grace through faith in Christ. He goes on, verse 7 through 13, talking about this harvest. And now how the people of God have this joyous time of harvesting. As the, as the grapevines come in, as they, the end of the summer has approached, and, they, and they, they have this whole gathering of wine. There's a, there's a festival. There's a cheerfulness. The, the summer's over. we got some time before we have to plant again. we got a little wine on the side as well, right? However, when the harvest goes bad because of God's judgment, things are very different. Look at verse 8. The singing stops. The tambourines and lyre are stilled. And verse 11, there's an outcry in the streets. There's no wine. All joy has grown dark. The darkness of the earth is banished. But yet there's a remnant. Verse 13, olives and grapes, small numbers during harvest time. And then something interesting happens. As this destruction, as this emptiness, as this desolation comes. Look at verse 14. They lifted up their voices. <laughs> this is a response to the destruction upon Jerusalem. They, they lifted up their voices and sing for joy at the majesty of God in the coastlands. Verse 15, they give him glory to his name. Verse 16, from the ends of the earth we hear songs of praise, of glory to the righteous one. 
the remnant, the, the ones that have been delivered, now have a song of rejoicing of their hearts. Their lips praise Him, the Lord. Escaping judgment makes way for the heart to rejoice. Isn't that the gospel? Isn't that the good news? We rejoice in the rescue of God. But the prophet's not there yet. He's a man broken. Keep reading. He can't join in the gladness. His vision is still about what's going to take place. Verse 16b, I say, I waste away, I waste, woe is me. The hopelessness of others deeply touches Isaiah as he, in the same woe is me, we saw in chapter 6, as he comes face to face with God, he says, woe is me. His cry is one of grief and of sadness. Just like Paul, Romans 9, I have great sorrow, he says, unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. And even though God was judging the wicked, the, the, the rescued were proclaiming. But then look what it says. For the traitors have betrayed. It was betrayal. The traitors have betrayed. In other words, there are those who just don't want to heed. In verse 17 through 18, Isaiah makes it clear no one's escaping. It's sad. This is, this is sad. The terror, the pit, the snare. Verse 18. He who flees at the sound of the terror shall fall into the pit. He who climbs out of the pit shall be caught in the snare. For the windows of heaven are open and the foundation of the earth tremble. You want, you want to get through the pit? Excuse me, the terror? You get through the terror, the pit will get you. If the terror and the pit don't get you, the snare will get you. No one, even, even, there's even an earthquake he speaks about in verse 20. The earth, uh, excuse me, verse 19. The earth is utterly broken. The earth is split apart. See that? Divine judgment. He says in verse 20, it's like a drunken man falling down or like shacks that just fall down. And what's the cause? Look again. Look again. Verse 20. What's the cause? It's transgressions, 20b. It's sins. It's transgression lies heavy upon the earth and it falls and will not rise again. All that you see, the prophet says, will will be done and will never rise up again. The earth as we know it will know there's a new heaven, new earth, but all that will be done will come to an end. Verse 21, the close. In that day, look what it says. In that day, the Lord will punish the host of heavens in heaven and on the kings of the earth and on the earth. They will be gathered together as prisoners in a pit. They'll be shut up in the prison and after many days they will be punished. Then the moon will be confounded and the sun ashamed. For the Lord of hosts reigns in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem. And his glory will be before his elders. In that day when history comes to a close. When the wicked are punished. In that day the Lord will come as the king of kings. Lord of lords to make things right. In that day those who are raised up against him in their, in their foolishness and their rebellion, their self-exaltation will be brought down in humiliation. No one will escape. Not the host of heaven, Satan and his demons, not the rulers of this earth. No one who exalt themselves against God will escape. They will be gathered. They will be collected. They'll be put in a pit. They'll be in prison. Look what it says. And unable to escape. And after many days, they will be punished. They'll, they'll, be, they'll be put in a pit, in the prison, and many days later, they will be punished. All who transgressed against the law can expect consequences when the Lord comes in his glory. Look what it says. The brightest things the world known, the sun and the moon, will hang their head in shame. Because they're irrelevant. When the brightness and the glorious and majesty of our God shows up, the everlasting light of God, no moon, no sun. The power of God to destroy all that is exalted against him. Those who rebel against God, violate his statutes, break his covenant, will pay for their sin. And then he says, at the very end of this verse, at the very end of this chapter, the old story, the old hope of Israel comes true. God alone will be Israel's king. God's final and victorious reign will be fully established. Now, I don't want you to miss this point, okay? If you're going to walk away today with anything, catch this. 
The focus is not primarily on the defeat inflicted on the powers of evil, but on the glory of the Lord and the reign of his righteous eternal kingdom. That's the focus. In fact, the, word Hebrew, the Hebrew word glory is the last word in this chapter, showing forth the glory of the new Israel, the glory of the, excuse me, new Jerusalem displayed for the elders. Now, quickly, I believe it's the millennial reign, the thousand-year reign of Christ in chapter 20. We see Revelation is very parallel to this with the destruction of the earth. You have tribulation, you have the millennial reign, and then you have the fulfillment and the consummation of the ages, and Christ comes with a new heaven and a new earth. That's the way I read this passage. My amillennial friends see that this is the end of the end. Chapter 21, not 20, but 21 and 22, where the end where Christ establishes the new heavens and a new earth. So be it. The message is very clear, though. The city of man will be burned away. Only a remnant will be left. The city of God will descend and become the city of man uh, with the God-man Christ at the center of of his union. That's what David says, that Christ will come, he will reign forever and ever in his eternal kingdom established for his elect, for his glory and for his elect. Let me give you two things to walk away and we're done. Number one, God is in control of all nations, America included. God knows what's going on. God did not wake up and say, ah, I turn my back for a minute and look at the mess they're in, okay? It doesn't work that way. He's in charge and he has, has a sovereignty over all the nations. And he alone should be worshipped and trusted. It is foolish to trust in nations, in false gods. Our citizenship is not earthly but heavenly. Yes, we should pray for the peace and prosperity of our nation, but our trust should be in God alone. Every nation is accountable to God, number one. Number two, therefore, there's no refuge. There is no refuge from the judgment and justice of God other than Christ. He is our only hope. He is our only refuge. God will bring an end to the sinful and rebellious earth and all its inhabitants. And in Christ is where we find our final and only refuge. That's the message. And as the band comes up, let, let me share this story with you. Band, come on up. Let me share this story with you, okay? Just give me another 30 seconds, a minute. If you remember, if you, have, if you know the Old Testament, there were two plagues that were brought upon Egypt. God brought upon Egypt when God finally and, and led and, and, and redeemed and delivered and rescued his people from bondage. When they were in Egypt, they were released from bondage from Egypt and sent to the promised land. There were two last plagues. What were they? Darkness and the death of the firstborn. Darkness, get ready. Ninth plague, tenth plague, firstborn. The one who represents the family. And when he visited Egypt, when God visited Egypt in that land, every single soul, both the Egyptians and the Israelites, everyone is guilty of sin and deserves judgment. Every one of them. But in obedience to the command of the prophet, the word of God, they what? They killed the lamb, took its blood, covered it over the doorstep on its post. And when the angel of death brought justice to the land, only those, only those who took shelter, who took refuge under the blood lived. The angel of death passed over. That's where we get the word Passover. Jesus Christ on the hill called Calvary, Mark 14, 15, tells us that darkness came, get ready. And then when our sin and judgment and Jesus bears our wrath, is poured out on him, he cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? John the Baptist saw Jesus and said, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Remember those who took shelter under the Lamb? That's who he is. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Paul just simply says, for Christ, our Passover Lamb has been sacrificed. So family, are you taking refuge under the Lamb? Have you run to the blood of Jesus, been washed and cleansed, and escaping judgment and justice that will come? God said it will, it will. And if you're a Christian here this morning, you've done that, are you rejoicing in that? Are you setting your hope on that? Are you setting your, your promise, your, excuse me, your trust in Christ and Christ alone? And if you're here this morning and you're not taking refuge under Christ, I implore you, come to Christ. He's our only refuge. He's our only hope. He's the only one that could spare us and cover us and protect us from the just wrath of God. 
God loves you and has provided a way. But he's holy and just and he must punish sin. Run to Christ. Find your refuge in Christ. Worship Christ. Revelations chapter 5. John looks around. Sees the throne. Living creatures and all the elders and a voice of many angels. Mirrors upon mirrors, thousands upon thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor, glory and blessing. Let us worship him. Father, thank you for this truth. And thank you, Lord, for the rescue, the promise, the, the redemption in Christ. You have provided a way. I, we pray that all of us would run to him and take shelter in the blood of the lamb and worship him and praise him for all that he is and all that he has done in Jesus' good name.